This week on Top Travel, Jeannie and Yanez are still in Greece, visiting the green island of Corfu, where they get to mingle with the mayor, tour the town, and get an aqua striding lesson from its inventor. Back on board, our duo focus on their dance competition, then visit the Italian city of Ravenna to pay respects to its greatest poet and learn the patience it takes to make a beautiful mosaic. Back on the ship and uh, all the time, like subconsciously, I've been thinking about this dance competition. It's hurting me inside. I'm nervous. With me. I'll try with you. I'll try with you. With you. me, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to dance with you. You'll be fine. But if I stand on your foot, I won't feel bad. I've decided to tackle the problem head on. I've decided to film my, my instructor with my phone so that I can actually watch it at night and go through all these, you know, quite difficult moves. But still, the the hips, they're not moving. They don't do the ocho. It's freaking me out. Can you, can you imagine, I'm such a proud person and now I'm in the gym on the ship, trying to like watch myself do the ocho and it's just highly embarrassing. I mean, that's the level, it's, it's, it's brought me down to that level where people are now looking at me, I'm standing in front of the marine gym and trying to move my hips and my hips ain't moving. Not just any Greek island. Corfu is the island that enchanted kings and poets. It's also the island that linked the east to the west. My favorite of all of the Greek islands by far. We're in beautiful Corfu today, the greenest and the most lush of all of the Greek islands. It's also the furthest north of all the Ionian islands and very different to the rest of Greece because it wasn't ruled by the Turks. Now, we couldn't find a tour guide today, so the mayoral office has opened up its doors to us and rolled out the red carpet. You know, I felt very important that Jeans had her feathers up, you know, we were meeting the mayor of Corfu, as one does. Visit Corfu, say hi to the mayor, how's it China, how are you doing? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, because of where Corfu is situated, it's had a very interesting history. The Venetians ruled here when the rest of Greece was ruled by the Ottomans. The French have been here, the English have been here. What impact has that had on, on society? Corfu is a very unique place, exactly because of the influence we had from English, French and Venetian people. The most um, effective uh, culture is Venetian culture. That's why you can see the most of the building. It's a reminiscence of Venetian period. Therefore, the municipality of Corfu and Corfu town is very similar to, to European cities because of the influence we had in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. And it's a, because of that, it's a very cosmopolitan place. It's a, a multicultural place and it's a, a crossroad between East and West. This is the most awkward moment of our lives. We've been invited by the mayor of Corfu to go into an official meeting with the mayor of Indonesia. Unfortunately, I didn't come dressed the part. I'm wearing little jean shorts and my leather sandals that I picked up in Athens. <laughs> but anyway, we'll be professional about this. Yeah, I guess we're not going to the beach. <laughs> and then we, we end up in this room with the mayor of Corfu, the ambassador of Indonesia to Greece, and top travel and they're handing over gifts to each other as they do in the diplomatic world and I had no gifts I had nothing to give what were we doing there <laughs> we were dressed ready for the beach ready for like to explore island life and Corfu we're just standing there like these two naughty children in the principal's office I didn't Susan. bring a gift you think I should offer you I'm not that kind of gift <laughs> Aliki, why on earth does Corfu have two castles? When uh, people from the ancient city of Corfu, which uh, was uh, three kilometers from here, uh, moved to the old castle in, old, in order to protect themselves from uh, several uh, invaders, uh, they decided uh, to build their houses within this place because uh, there are two natural huge rocks which were protecting them from these invaders. In these ages, the Venetians were the protectors of Corfu and uh, of the seven Ionian islands. 
they have been the protectors for 400 years. So they decided to strengthen Kofu and construct very, very strong fortifications and walls within the castle, build another castle, so that's why we have two castles, in order to get protected by the Ottoman attacks. What was it about Corfu that everybody wanted? Why were there so many invasions? The position of Corfu is very strategic because it's between the Mediterranean and the Adriatic Sea. And uh, peoples or republics like the Venetian, who had very big commerce and interest in the Mediterranean, uh, they wanted to use Corfu as a base. The Ottomans wanted to use Corfu as the entrance to Europe. That's why. Um, Corfu was an interesting place for all these peoples. But this feels like we're walking through the streets of Paris. Yes, because Napoleon the Great, when he became an emperor in France, he decided to give uh, the Parisian air all over the places that he dominated in Europe. So French built this building in Corfu, and basically this is the French stamp in Corfu. Every corner you turn in Corfu, you feel like you're in a different place. One minute looks like you're in England, the next minute looks like you're in Paris, the next minute when you see all these burger chains, you feel like you're in America. It's like, where are we? <laughs> This building is magnificent. What is it? This building was built by the British in the 1820s um, as a residence for the governor of the Ionian Islands. And nowadays, it's an Asian art museum with a very important collection of uh, Asian art donated by an ambassador years ago. And uh, this collection is one of the most important uh, Asian collections in Europe. I know traditionally the French and English haven't always been best friends, but is that a cricket pitch opposite the French buildings which is opposite the English buildings. <laughs> yes it is. <laughs> all together, all, all influences together in this little city, very historical city. Uh, yes this is the cricket field and uh, we have uh, here the national cricket team of Greece. I caught you. <laughs> cricket first started in Corfu in 1823 because Corfu was under British rule and the first game was between a group of officers and the garrison. Stay tuned, we get an aqua striding lesson, then Yanez loses his cool on the water, falls apart on the dance floor, but miraculously recovers to tour the city of Ravenna. You want to know the most important facts about Corfu? I'll give you just one. Visitors at guest houses, hotels, bed and breakfasts always ask the same question. Can I stay here longer? And that was the only question running through my mind. I did not want to leave. <laughs> I wish I'd bought one of those I love Corfu t-shirts because this place has really surprised me. It has a bit of everything. It's got the history, it's got the culture, the old town is magnificent, and then it has all of this natural beauty. It's incredible, and we're getting deep down into island style, and one of the best ways to enjoy it is from the water. In fact, we're gonna be doing something that you can only do here in Corfu called aqua striding. You chose the sport, right? I really did. You know why? It's walking on water. Nordic walking on water. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's just so cool. I mean, he is the water guru in Greece. And, I mean, he comes from a, an amazing history of water skiing championships in Disneyland, the works. And now he runs the water show in Corfu. Nico, you're the inventor of Aqua Striders. Where did the idea come from? Well, I had that idea a long time before, when I used to train in Florida for water ski. I'm a professional water skier. So, on the lake I used to live, I was with friends and talking sometime. I said, if we do something, we can be able to walk in the water, we can make good money. And he said, you crazy Greek, how possible? <laughs> I said, well, why not? We do, I, do, I have some idea, I try if it works, I'll let you know. Nikos invented the Aqua Strider, as they call it, in 2003 and got a worldwide patent for it. It's quite a, a different uh, water apparatus. It's very physical um, and it takes quite a lot of, of, of technique and, and strength at the same time. It's not the most exhilarating water sport. You don't go 100 kilometers an hour. You don't do any slides or spins, but to build core strength and leg strength, it's superb. <laughs> Spread eagle immediately, I predict. I'm impressed, I'm well impressed. 
I think I would have done a better job had Yunez not been teasing me as much as he was. But it was quite fun. I managed to do it successfully. He didn't think that I was going to last as long as I did. I didn't fall. She's good. Good, good first time? Yeah, it's very good. Oh my goodness gracious me. My thighs are on fire. I love this machine. Nick, in fact, still holds the world record for tricks and jumps, and he's held this record for over 35 years. I'd say this man has a few tricks up his sleeve when it comes to water sports. manliness exactly when you get a bit scared. You go very Michael Jackson. <laughs> it's my it's my inner lady. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I heard her. <laughs> Keep it like it. Ladies first. Because <laughs> clearly I'm a lady. Yeah, you know, I've realized that in ancient Greece I wasn't a Spartan at the front line. I was the shield maiden carrying all the supplies with my brave soldiers ahead of me. Are you okay? Are your tears dry. <laughs> Stop being mean to me. <laughs> I've never laughed so hard in my life. Thank you. All together. And you see. The dancing emotionally drained me. It gave me anxiety. It stressed me out. I couldn't sleep at night. And it was just a burden on my shoulders. And I, I simply couldn't deal with it anymore. OK. Again. Here we go. I'm doing it. I can't do this. No, I'm not doing this anymore. That's embarrassing. It's really embarrassing. He broke down. Mm. I had a mental and physical breakdown. I cracked. So there was no ways I was going to do this dance competition. I started getting creative, and I thought the obvious would be to fake injury. Don't even ask, I'm, I'm devastated. I walked in there to this beautiful ballroom with all these glamorous dancers with my crutches, my bandaged foot and my long face. And not for a second did Jeannie doubt me. She believed that I was genuinely in a lot of pain. James, I'm, I'm devastated, I'm broken, I don't know what to do. You know, no, 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 let me, let me explain. Yesterday when we were doing the water sports, I really hurt myself and that's why I was screaming and shouting because I was in so much pain and it's yeah. an old sporting injury and I know how much this competition but means to you. But you weren't hurt, you walked away, you I were know, laughing, I you were fine the whole was, afternoon. I, I, just, I was manning up and I was, I was thinking just be brave but, and I thought maybe it will heal by today but I, I can't, I'm... I can't do this. I'm so broken twice because we could have won this competition. We could have won this, so oh, no. you I'm so... I'm so... Ah, ah, oh, don't touch it. I felt so sorry for him. I know how, how hard he wanted to do this. I know how, he, he's really loyal to me and I know he wanted to be part of this competition. He knew what it meant to me and I saw the disappointment in his face. Today I'm on a solo mission as I explore Ravenna, Italia. Sadly, I lost my co-star to illness. He uh, had an old sports injury and he is in a lot of pain. Cha, 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 cha. What are you doing? <laughs> You're gonna hate me right now, huh? I couldn't, I couldn't face up to the dancing competition last night. I was completely embarrassed, but I, I've got the moves, so I'm You're doing thinking... a perfect ocho. We could have won that thing last night. It's a perfect one, eh? You know what, what was I even thinking entering you into a competition? You don't even have enough rhythm to clap properly. But let's use my rhythm and explore the city, darling. Come follow me. Cha, 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 cha. Strangles. Veiny, vain little neck. A chicken. Chicken. That's what he is. Chicken. My wrongs were soon forgotten because we had arrived in Ravenna, which is a city of arts and culture. A city famous for all those beautiful mosaics. And it's also a city that 1600 years ago became the capital three times. Capital of the Western Roman Empire, capital of the Goths, 
and capital of the Byzantine Empire. Ravenna is a very old city, it's plus minus 2,000 years old, but strategically, if you look at it on a map, it's found between Venice on the one side and Florence on the other side. It was uh, founded in a very strategic place on an island, uh, like uh, less more Venice today, and was chosen in the beginning of 5th century like a capital of the Roman Empire, of the Western Roman Empire, after the fall of Rome. And so Ravenna lived the two centuries of glory with a, a lot of uh, important people living there and with a, a lot of monuments uh, built in this period. Next, Gini and Yanez pay respects to Italian poet Dante and piece together the connection between Ravenna and the mosaics before travelling to Venice. Ravenna was the town that inspired the likes of Lord Byron. Oscar Wilde and Dante Alighieri. He was exiled to Ravenna, wrote his most famous works there, like the Divine Comedy, and then later died there. Why was Dante Alighieri so important to Ravenna? Dante is important for Ravenna citizens, but for all Italian citizens all over in the world, because uh, he is a, a symbol of Italian language was the first writer writing in uh, Italian, in the language of the simple people living in Italy and not in Latin. In Italy there's this real tug of war. Who does Dante Alighieri really belong to? Is it the people of Ravenna or is it the people of Florence? He was born in Florence, but he was exiled to Ravenna where he died. There's an interesting story where the people of Florence have always wanted his remains to be returned. Yes, <laughs> because they are the Florentine people were very uh, jealous uh, because uh, Dante Alighieri is, is well known in the world and the Divine Comedy is the most translated book after Bible in the world. And so the Florentine people tried many many times during the centuries to uh, come back the remains of Dante Alighieri to Florence. But finally Dante Alighieri is only here and is our poet. <laughs> We then went on to the San Francesco Basilica, which also happens to be the place where Dante Alighieri was buried. And there were the most incredible mosaics there to be seen. There are a lot of mosaics underwater. Every day of the year, we have these mosaics. And for us, it's a very important place because it was the first burial place of our poet, Dante Alighieri. Why is it underwater? Yes, because uh, we have the same problem uh, like in Venice. So we have the problem of the progressive sinking of the ground. And so, um, every, uh, so to find uh, the original uh, Roman and Byzantine floor, we have to, to go uh, almost uh, three, four meters under the present level of the town. The San Francesco Basilica felt like something out of a movie. And that beautiful crypt that was completely flooded with those mosaics and those tiny goldfish swimming around is something that will always stick in my memory. Ravenna is not the place where mosaics originated, but it's the place where they found their greatest expression. It's a place where Christian iconology was founded. Symbolism versus realism, Byzantine influence versus Roman influence. What is the connection between Ravenna and mosaics and, and what were they initially used for? Ravenna was the capital for mosaics. Um, it started as um, flooring for most of the uh, buildings here in town. It was the only flooring that they really had. Um, from there it e evolved and um, through the centuries it became B the Byzantine Empire. Um, and from there, of course, the city exploded with mosaics and um, it's covered all of the walls of the city as well for political and religious purposes. I've always loved the romance behind mosaics. In my own home, I use a lot of mosaics because it reminds me of that time, of all those old churches and also the craft. Just, it's, it's peaceful, it's timeless and it's beautiful. It really is an art that I've got a huge appreciation for. Luciana, what are the different materials you use for mosaics? The material is like the ancient. It's a glass paste produced in Venice in, in real million of color. And also stones and marble. And uh, we cut uh, this uh, glass uh, with these tools. It's called Hammer and Hardy, like uh, in the Roman time. And we are able to cut like we want, little, medium, bigger, triangle, wow. 
Um, That's tiny. How many times have you cut oh, your fingers? Uh, it's 40 years that I cut my teeth and now my fingers are not uh, broken. <laughs> what I find fascinating is the techniques they use is still founded on manual production. The only thing that's changed over the ages is the binding material. How long would it take to finish this? Oh, one month. One month? Because the tests are very, very tiny and uh, we spend uh, um, two weeks and a half to make. And after we need to waiting until it's dry, to gluing, to remove, to clean. It's a long process, yes. Okay. Well, I'll stay for two minutes and try and make Okay. Sure <laughs> and now I am teaching you, eh? Yeah. <laughs> take that. Okay. You can do that bit, I'm yes. too scared. Take that in your hand, yeah. very mm, hard. Okay. Oh. It's a perfect size, eh? Yes, fantastic. You are a good slave. <laughs> Thank you. And remember that today it's so <laughs> difficult to find slaves. <laughs> Mosaic is quite an incredible skill. I mean, you need intense focus, intense talent, and you need, like, Forrest Gump-style endurance, none of which I possess. Yanez's father, on the other hand, is an incredibly great artist. So, apparently, some of that got passed down in the DNA. Wow. Voila! Hey. It's a masterpiece, and in two hours! Hey, give me five! <laughs> Fantastic! What a good slave! If you like to work with us, uh, when you have time, I coming, please. I start next year. But for free, eh? For not, free, not, for free. Like a slave, so not... For, for the love of the art. <laughs> okay, Thank well. you so much. <laughs> Mwah. Mwah. You are welcome. <laughs> it's fantastic. She had a good oh, sleep for Good morning. <laughs> He's good. <laughs> Just because I don't read so good, or because I don't dance real good or move them hips real good doesn't mean that I can't make mosaics real good. Europe's been such an incredible adventure, starting in Venice, going through Scandinavia, exploring the entire Mediterranean and ending back up where it all began in Venice. We started our journey in Venice and now we're ending it in Venice, but the one thing we forgot to do while we were here last time was... A gondola a ride. gondola. We have to. We Ladies have to. first. Thank you. La Dolce Vita. Thank you. This European adventure has been so magical, but it's come to an end. And, and we've done Europe before. We've, we've traveled Europe, but we are African. Starting and ending in Venice, just like the tourist. <laughs> the journey continues, and it's going to get difficult. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be completely different as we explore our backyard, Africa. Next week on Top Travel, Jeannie and Yanez kick off their African adventure in Robertson's Valley for a little fine wining and dining before moving on to Otuan in the Karoo to get up close and personal with its famous ostriches and crocodiles. They then forge on to Kimberley, home of the Big Hole, where Jeannie hopes to strike it lucky.